Hey, y'all. As you make your way to 1 John chapter 4 this morning, um, most of you probably got an email from me this week and talking about how we, we ended the fiscal year just uh, on June 30th. Our fiscal year at Lighthouse Church goes from July 1st through June 30th. And so we've been... Uh, you know, in the budgeting process, all that kind of thing. But it turns out we, we ended up $84,000 short of what we projected for the, this past year. And, uh, and so that has caused us to have to cinch up the belt and tighten. And we've had to cut some things and, and all of that. To, you know, we have to live within, within our means. And, um, and so... All that to say, I don't want this to be a, a, a burden on you, um, you know, because what kind of a giver does God love? A cheerful one. Woohoo! I love to give. So it, I don't want this to feel like, oh, you know, that it's doomsday and I have to like dig deep. And no, just pray. And, and if I could encourage you, become a faithful biblical giver. The church operates on the faithful giving of its people. That's the way God designed it. All the way beginning in the Old Testament with the tabernacle temple, all the way into the New Testament. And so if you call Lighthouse Church home, please consider becoming part of a faithful giver in this household of faith. We need you. We really do. Well, let's pray and we'll get after it here in 1 John 4. Thank you, God, um, that you are our provider. And so we know that you know our needs. And, um, and so we look to you and that you would, Lord, move through us, your people, to meet the needs, Lord, of your church. And that we would continue to be a light on a hill and to reach the world that you have put before us to reach and so speak to us, God, this morning about love and how it is our unique birthmark as children of God. And, and teach us, Lord, how to walk in it and display it, enjoy it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after the Beatles broke up, John Lennon was being interviewed, and uh, when asked about Paul McCartney's songwriting, John made a little, kind of a little bit of a derogatory remark. He said, well, Paul, you know, he, he writes the silly little love songs. That's my best John Lennon right there. <laughs> and so Paul, Paul saw that and, and read it, and he, he responded by writing a song. And that song actually would go to number one. It would be his greatest hit, Paul McCartney and Wings, uh, in the United States. And the words of that song go like this. You'd think that people would have had enough of silly love songs. But I look around me and I see it isn't so. Some people want to fill the world with silly love songs. And what's wrong with that? I'd like to know. And here I go again. I love you. Silly love songs. I think the Apostle John would resonate with Paul McCartney's sentiment. And although John isn't writing about, you know, romantic love between lovers or even familial love necessarily, he's writing about God's love. And this is the third time in this little epistle that he is addressing this subject of love. It is super, super important. And so this love, which is unique to God, is also then unique to God's people. It marks God's people as legitimate. And so let's read our two verses, verses 7 and 8, and then we'll come back for two observations this morning, and we'll save the rest for next week. So 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, this is the unique word. When John uses the word love, it's the unique Greek word agapeo, which is not a word that was common in classical Greek. It was a 
word that was manufactured essentially by the New Testament writers, John, Paul, and so on, because there wasn't a Greek word that could characterize this love of God. And so it is uniquely a word that has its origin in the New Testament writers. So this love is a love that only God's people... No, now are we saying that other people don't love? No, 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 we're not saying that at all. But we are saying that there's a unique love that, that emanates from God, and even more so that God is, and we'll talk more about that next week, that God's people have the unique ability to walk in and display this unique love. In the Fadness household, we sang these two verses many times. Whenever there was a conflict, whenever, whenever there was bickering amongst the kids, kids, sit down, and we're going to sing. Beloved, let us love one another, love one another. Because I said, sing. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, no, no, God. God is love. God is love, my loving. We sang that hundreds of times in our household through clenched teeth and anger. Two things we want to tackle this morning in relation to these two verses. First of all, the new birth. This love, it comes from the new birth. Look at it again, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Has been born of God. I remember seeing one of those Charles Schultz Peanuts cartoons years ago, and uh, Lucy is just pondering, you know, life and going, do you think, Linus, do you think it's possible for people to really change? And Linus goes, yeah, I do. I mean, this, I've changed a lot in this last year. And Lucy goes, well, I, I mean, for the better. <laughs> Ouch. Do people ever really change? Is it possible to get a new start, a new life? The Bible says absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. John speaks of people being born of God. And this is a birth that's in addition to our physical birth. It's the Apostle John who recorded the, um, the meeting, the nighttime meeting between Jesus and this very influential Jewish man named Nicodemus. And, and so John records that whole situation. You can turn there if you want to. I want to just spend a few moments there um, because this is kind of the classic text. It's a, a teaching by Jesus on what it means to be born of God. And so it says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus goes to Jesus at night. We can speculate, probably true. Nicodemus was a prominent guy, didn't want to risk his reputation by, seeing, by being seen with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a northerner, one of those, you know, northerners from the country up in the Galilee region. And, you know, the, they drive trucks with gun racks up there. You know, the girls chew tobacco. It's that kind of a place up there. And this is down in Jerusalem, and it's, you know, it's cosmopolitan and, and all of that. And so I think Nicodemus didn't want to be, didn't want to risk his reputation, but he was intrigued by this country boy <laughs> who taught like no one else had taught and was doing things that no one else had ever done. And there was something stirring in him. There was a, a stirring in his soul. Well, a couple things we want to consider. 
about Nicodemus because this is important. He was religious. He was religious. Verse 1 says he was a Pharisee. He was one of about 6,000 of these Pharisees at Jesus' time. And, uh, and these guys had to pledge before at least three witnesses that they were going to keep the law with all of their heart and all of their strength all of the days of their life. To them, the law was the, uh, the Torah. Uh, the first five books, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But here's what you need to know, is that the Jews, they, they looked at the Torah and go, wow, it's complete, but, but it's not specific in many of the areas. It doesn't cover specifically all the areas of life. So we're going we're gonna to expand, we're going to amplify the Torah, and we're going to take the principles, and we're going to amplify them into specific rules and laws. And they did that to the hundreds and even the thousands. And so, for instance, the Sabbath law, they were told in the law to remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, and no one must work on that day. Take a day off, rest. But the Jews would spend hour after hour, day after day, defining what work, what is work? If we must not work, what is work? So, here's what they did. To tie a knot on the Sabbath day was to work. But then the question becomes, what kind of knot? So, reading from the Talmud, quote, the following are the knots that render a man guilty if he ties them. The knot of camel drivers and that of sailors. Anyone tying or untying these knots is guilty. No camel's knots, no sailor's knots on the Sabbath. On the other hand, knots which could be tied with one hand were legal. So if you could do it with one hand, you're good. And again, I quote from the Talmud, a woman may tie up a slit in her shift and the strings of her cap and those of her girdle, the straps of her shoes, sandals, skin, uh, skins of wine or oil. So tying those, you know, cinching up your underwear, essentially, that's fine on the Sabbath, no problem. So here's what would happen. Someone would want to lower a bucket into a well to get some water out of it, but it was the Sabbath day. You can't tie ropes on the Sabbath day because that is work. So what could a person do to get that bucket of water without breaking the Sabbath law? Hmm. Well, though it was illegal to tie a rope, it was totally legal to tie a girdle. Honey, I need some underwear. I need a few girdles. I need to get some water. It's the Sabbath day. And that's what they would do. They would find ways around the laws that they had created specifically in order to be able to do what they wanted to do. So this was what they did. Nicodemus was one of those guys, a Pharisee. Secondly, he was important. He was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a part of the Sanhedrin, which was a council of 70 men who had total authority over the religious life of the Jews in Israel. So kind of a supreme court of Israel. He was one of those guys, which means by implication, he was wealthy. He was set for life financially. He was famous. Everybody knew him. Not, not our kind of famous. People today are famous for being famous. We live in a weird time. People are YouTube famous and famous for being famous, you know, Kardashian famous and, re, you know, reality TV famous. It's weird today. He was famous as being a person of substance and character in Israel, a person of position. And so the Bible says he went to Jesus at night. There was something stirring in him. Can I suggest to you that 
that always when a, when a person is, is being drawn to Jesus, it begins with a, with a stirring. With there's, 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 just, there's something missing here. Okay, I, I, I'm religious, and I've got everything really I could want in life. I've got position, I've got power, I've got money, I've got fame, but there's something missing. And those winds were blowing in Nicodemus. And he saw this Galilean who was saying things about the kingdom and doing things that he'd never seen before. And this may be it. He's thinking. This may be what I'm missing. Something was stirring in him. 3,000 years ago, the richest man in the world at that time, Solomon, he wrote in his writing called Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11, he says that he, God, has set eternity in their hearts. I think what he was saying is that that human beings have, have something in them that longs for that, that which is eternal. And, and, and though I think we try and satisfy that with temporal stuff, we, we go after things, we, we pursue things, we, we get after stuff, and, and maybe it's relationships or you know, accomplishments, or I'm into this, I'm into that, but it, it, it never touches that thing inside and we get to this accomplishment and we think oh I don't, life will be so great when i get here but that 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 eternal thing it's still there a temporal pursuit or a temporal thing can't touch it it can't get to it and so C.S. Lewis, well, he put it like this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You may have been awakened to an emptiness in your soul. It's interesting that for Nicodemus, power and influence couldn't touch that thing in him. Wealth couldn't do it. Religion couldn't touch it. He was bothered. Hey, listen, that sense of emptiness that you feel, it may be that God is just drawing you to his son. It may be the wind of the Holy Spirit that's ruffling the feathers, the leaves in your life right now. It's a good thing. Now watch what Jesus has to say to this guy, Nicodemus, John 3, 3. Jesus answered him, said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there it is. Nicodemus, listen, unless someone is born again, born a second time, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You are, you are outside of the kingdom until you are born again. You have to be born a second time, not physically, but spiritually. We know that because Nicodemus was confused. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So Nicodemus is going, wait a minute, I'm old. How can I be born again? I can't crawl back into my mom's womb. That would just be weird. And Jesus, no, no, no. That which is born of flesh is flesh. You, you all were born once, everyone in this room, born physically. But have you been born spiritually? 
That which is born of spirit is spirit. And unless you're born again, you can't, you can't see the kingdom. You can't know God. You're, you're, you're distanced from God unless you're born a second time, born of God. Jesus is talking <laughs> to one of the most dedicated Jewish men in all the world at that time. And he basically tells him, hey, your first birth, you know, the one that brought you into the world, into a good Jewish family, a descendant of Abraham and all the rest, it's no good. It doesn't get you into the kingdom. You have to be born again. So that statement that Jesus made to Nicodemus, it shattered the Jewish thinking that it was their ethnic identity, their ancestry, their familial heritage that secured their salvation. No, it didn't, and no, it doesn't. How is anyone saved today? It's not by who their family is. It isn't because your mom and dad were amazing missionaries who went to Africa or your parents are incredible Christians admired by everybody or your family's prominent in this church or that. It doesn't get you in. There are no grandchildren in heaven. Only children of God. You have to be born into God's family, born again. It was taught widely among the Jews at that time that since they descended from Abraham, they were automatically assured of salvation. In fact, some rabbis taught that Abraham actually was stationed at the gates of hell to make sure none of his descendants accidentally wandered into hell. Most of the Jews at that time, they looked for Messiah to bring a new world and a new government, one where they would rule with him over the rest of the planet. They would no longer be subservient to the Romans. They would be ruling and reigning with the Messiah. But Jesus came, and yes, he brought the kingdom. <laughs> but that kingdom is established in people in people who will say yes to his lordship. And yes, he's coming back to establish his kingdom on earth physically, that's gonna happen. But now, it's establishing his rule and reign in humans like you and like me and like Nicodemus, who perhaps we start to feel the wind blow in our life and things are upset, things are not the way maybe we want them to be and where it's going, is there something missing? You must be born again. How does that work? Well, God does it. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We can't born again ourselves. God does it. God causes us to be born again. Well, how does it work? Do, how, do I sign up for it? Where does it? How does it happen? Do I get into some special plate where, well, here's how it works. You say yes to Jesus. You receive him by faith. What do you mean? Well, the scripture, John 1, 12, to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So, so it's you saying yes to Jesus. It's God causing you to be born again. That's how it works. And when you receive Christ as Savior and Lord by faith, you will receive a birthmark. When you are born again, you will receive a birthmark. Look again at 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So love is the birthmark of those who have been born of God. God is love, it says in verse 8. We'll, we'll drill down on that huge next week. But if we are united to God through faith in Christ, then we share God's nature. God is love. Now we share in the nature of God. And since his nature is love, love becomes our core. It becomes our true north. It is the, the, the very core of who we are as God's people. It's our nature now to love. And not, not the, again, not, not the various forms of, of human love, but to love with God's love, agapeo love. It's unconditional. A navigator depends on a compass to help him determine his course. Well, today we depend on Siri, but a while back. Why, why a compass? Because a compass shows him his directions. Why does the compass point north? Why, why is that arrow always pointing north? Because it is so constituted that it responds to the magnetic field that is a part of the Earth's makeup there at the North Pole. The magnetic pole always pulls that needle directly north. And so you can always know the compass is responsive to the nature of the Earth. And so it is with Christian love. The nature of God is love. God is love. And a person who knows God, has, has been born of God, will respond to God's nature. We're tuned to it. We're drawn to it. And it's part of who we are. Now granted, we can't be passive about it. We, we have participation. We have to be intentional. So how does that work? Okay, so, so if... You know, if, if love is of God and everyone that's born of God, uh, you know, loves with this love, then what does it look like and how do, we, how do we experience it? How do we enjoy it? How do we day to day have it flowing through us? Paul, I think one of the most helpful metaphors that, that Paul uses is clothing. So, so we put, put it on. Now, now that could sound like, oh, you mean I'm just, I'm being fake. I'm, I'm, it's a put on. Well, this isn't the fake kind of put on. This is the put on that makes you true to who you actually are. The Bible has a lot to say about this, but clothing is an interesting thing. We wear it to keep us warm. We wear it to cover our nakedness. We, we wear it to make statements, perhaps, about who we are, what kind of person we are. Um, but, but clothing is something that is readily apparent to everyone. Everyone sees what we are wearing. It's outward, it's visible, everyone wears clothes. So, so it's a multi-billion dollar industry in the world. Clothing makers anticipate, they try and anticipate trends and, and so on, what's hot, what's not, and all of that. You know, these big award shows, like the biggest part of these award shows now is the red carpet before the actual show. Is Like that's the biggest deal at the Academy. Academy Awards and the Grammys and the Emmys. It's like, oh, who are you wearing today? You know, and everybody has these incredible expensive clothes on. It's a big deal. But fashions come and go in this world. I wish we could have stayed in 1972. <laughs> Guy Hendrickson, friend of mine, he's three years older than me, but we were good friends, and I was 10 years old, 11 years old. Guy Hendrickson got the biggest pair of bell bottoms. I mean, they were just huge bell bottoms, just giant bell bottoms, and, and they were jeans, but they had white vertical stripes going down all the way around. I mean, they were just massive, powerful fashion statement. Well, bell bottoms came and they went, and they came and they went. And they came and they went. That's the nature of fashion. But this isn't the nature 
of the Christian's clothing at all. As a matter of fact, our clothing will transcend this life. It goes on to the next. And that's why this is the stuff we got to concentrate on, gang. This is the stuff that, that matters beyond anything in this life. So, for instance, I'm just going to use one, one scripture this morning, and we're going we're to end pretty early this morning, I think. So, where did I lost my scripture? There it is, Colossians chapter 3. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on. That's that's dress talk. So so to put on, just like this morning, you had to you had to think, okay. I need to put on my shorts and my sandals and my, I'm laying out my clothes. This is, I'm going to be intentional. This is what I'm wearing today. So Paul is saying, think about what you're going to wear spiritually today. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, here it is, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So Lord, when I get out of bed in the morning... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a compassionate heart, and I'm going to put that on today. I want to I wanna feel for people today. I don't want to just be oblivious to, to the humans that are going to be coming across my path today. I want to feel for them. I want to be able to have a heart for them. I want to I wanna be humble. I want to clothe myself with humility. I want to just swag around and think I'm all that. I want to I wanna consider others as better than myself today. I want to clothe myself with meekness, which isn't weakness. Meekness is power under control. So though somebody might slight me, I'm not going to rise up and retaliate or respond. I'm going to, I'm going to smile. Like Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And that's Jesus. Jesus, who spoke the world into existence. Jesus, all-powerful Jesus. And I'm going to put on patience. And above all of it, I'm going to put on love. Because, Lord, you are love. And so I want to see with your eyes today. I want to feel with your heart. I want to think with your mind. And so, God, I'm taking the the wardrobe that you've given to me. It's my wardrobe as your son, as your daughter. And I'm putting on the clothes today. And I'm going to walk in. And and when I get drawn into the flesh, when today, when whatever, my patience gets tested or whatever, and I get drawn, Lord, be quick to remind me that that I would be quick to to confess to you my struggle or confess to you my failure, that I can get back and, and, and be clothed again. And so I want to walk in this love. Beloved, let us love one another. This love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. The Holy Spirit makes this wardrobe available to those who have been born of God. It's who we are. We're born of God. God is love. Is the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing in your life? Whether you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, or not. Is something bugging you in your life? It was the day after the Feast of Tabernacles had concluded. The the, the great feast where Jesus stood on the Temple Mount and and declared himself amongst those hundreds of thousands of people that he was the Messiah, the sent one, and that he alone had living water for anyone who would come to him thirsty. It's the day after that. 
And Jesus comes to a blind man, and he does something very curious, very interesting. He gets down, and he hocks up a loogie. <coughs> and he spits, he spits into the dirt. He then, he kind of rubs it around, and he gets this, this sticky mud substance going. He takes it into his, his hand, and he rubs it on the eyes of this blind man. He's just rubbing this spit mud on the guy's eyes. And then he tells him, hey, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the blind guy's, yeah, I'm going to definitely go wash. <laughs> I mean, somebody put spit on you, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm, you know, if I have like whatever sticky stuff on my face, I'm going to the back. I'm getting it off. And the guy went to the pool of Siloam, which would be no easy thing as a blind man. Why mud in the eye? Why does the Lord allow irritating things, even gross things, into your life, my life, to get us to go to Siloam? To get us to go to the sent one and to be able to wash in his water the water of his word. When do I seek the Lord most earnestly and intently? It's when I've got mud on my eyes. It's when I'm irritated and bugged and out of sorts and blind in areas. That's, that's when I seek him. If you've never received the Lord into your life, the the irritation that you feel now, the trouble that you're having in life. Listen, it's meant to drive you to Siloam. It's meant to take you to the place where you can be delivered. Let Jesus deliver you today, would you? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that, um, that you are love. Um, it's a part of your character and nature. It's not the only facet to who you are, but it is a glorious and beautiful facet. And it is the birthmark of your children. They will know you by the love that you have one for another. So, Lord, I'm afraid we probably underestimate this by a long shot. And so I want to pray for us as a church that, Lord, that we would be known by our love for each other here at Lighthouse Church. And, and so, Lord, if we are, um, if we're struggling and probably a lot of us are. Um, we, we've got mud in our eyes. We've got bitterness in our heart towards this person or that. And we're so easily entangled in the flesh. So this morning, Lord, could, could this morning be a, a Siloam moment for us where we can be cleansed and delivered, renewed and made free? from the things that bug us and bind us and, and, and hinder your love from flowing through us. Your love is so powerful and beautiful and pure and unstoppable. It never fails. We, we fail your love sometimes, but it never fails. So, Lord, this morning for your people... Would you free us? Would you open our blind eyes and bring renewal to us? Lord, for those who are not your people, but they have found themselves just 
realizing there's something missing. Been chasing various things in life and I just keep coming around that there's, there's something. There's something more. Lord, for those people, would you draw them into a saving relationship today? So with our heads bowed, as we get ready to make our way to the communion table, for those of you who are ready to put your faith in Jesus, um, you just need to know your sins have been paid for by Jesus at the cross. Your life has been won by Jesus, by him beating death, rising from it. Salvation is offered freely to you today. And so if you would like to be saved, having your sins washed away, you're ready to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. God bless you right over here. Anybody else, raise up your hand. And I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer to receive Christ. Just like the Bible says, how, how is a person born of God? Well, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power, the right to become children of God. Children who are born not of their own will, the will of man, but of the will of God. Is the Holy Spirit working in your life? Have you been drawn? God bless you. Anybody else? All right. Lord, thank you for these who have raised their hands. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would do what only you can do and that you would bring new life to them, causing them to be born of God, born again. If you raised your hand just now, I want you to pray this prayer. Repeat it after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, that you died for my sins, that you rose from death. I receive you now by faith as my Lord and Savior. And so from this day forward, my life belongs to you. And I am a part of your kingdom. Now help me to walk with you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome those who prayed.